we go. My brothers and sisters, I uh, said I was going to hopefully do a future video at some point on uh, the day of the Lord, so we're just going to attempt to pull together some verses and uh, the theme of the day of the Lord, which we know really what it is. It's, it's the wrath of God. It's the judgment of God. And um, so we'll make some connections where we can make them. And, and uh, if you go in and you do a thorough study on many of these verses and the words, uh, it's going to open your eyes to a lot of other connections. I'll tell you when I got started on this study, I just, I, you know what, I could have just kept going and going and going and going because one passage just led me into another and into another thought on the whole thing. Um, so we'll begin in Jeremiah 9.17. I don't know that I'll get through it all tonight. I might cut it in half and make it into two videos because it is a lot of information. So it depends on how many uh, thoughts get thrown in along the way. So Jeremiah 9.17, it says this. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider ye and call for the morning women, that they may come and send for cunning women that they may come it's saying call for your wise women and for those who will weep for your loss uh, and uh, in that God remembers us right and let them make haste and take up a wailing for us that our eyes may run down with tears and that our eyelids gush out with water verse 19 for a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion by the women um, how are we spoiled? We are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land. And why did they forsake it? Because our dwellings have cast us out. They no longer wanted them in possession. And uh, we've discussed what that all means. So we'll keep on. Verse 20. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O ye women, and let your ear receive the word of her mouth. And... Teach your daughters wailing, and every one her neighbor lamentation. Verse 21, for death has come up into our windows. Let's, let's recall that. Let's keep that in our mind, that word windows, because it's going to come up in another passage that's very um, important that we understand uh, the, the allegory to this here. So for death has come up into our windows and is entered into our palaces. That's interesting because the word here is plural. To cut off the children from without and the young men from our streets. So where does this Holy Spirit of the covenant, right, uh, take back what was rightfully hers? Because we are looking at the casting off of the spirit that was behind daughter Zion's covenant, which was the righteous daughter, all right? That's, that's your understanding. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy One of Israel, they were casting her off at this time, the spirit of her covenant. And they were uh, hearkening to a covenant with the harlot spirit because uh, it tickled their ears and it allowed men to build themselves up under their own man-made laws and lies, religious lies and laws. Um, so where a, a lot of this language in this actually leads us to Joel 2, so we're going to read in Joel 2, and we're going to connect a whole bunch of other passages. And yes, this is bringing us all to the day of the Lord and to what it all concerns. So Joel 2, 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And boy, is it. Um, but just... A note in here, the verse we're going to look at right quick, Isaiah 34, verse, uh, you, you'd want to look at 1 to 8, but we'll look at 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. And why? Why is it the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for what? What is the day of the Lord about? For the controversy of Zion. And what did we discover in our studies over a course of time, we didn't just come to this conclusion overnight. It took us many, many studies to get to the understanding of what the controversy of Zion was about. And it was about the splitting of the pleasant land 
And once we understood that the pleasant land, once again, represented the daughters of Zion, their bodies, these women, and they divided that covenant, the land, into two covenants, which you see represented as two women in your allegory in Galatians 4, if you go in and you study that. So God is saying, the controversy of Zion, the day of the Lord, is about what you did to my covenant when you determined to split it into two covenants and basically into two groups. <coughs> and you made a covenant with the harlot because it tickled your ears and it was like honey on your tongue and it, it's wormwood in your stomach, it's killing you. But you men loved it and you hearkened to the harlot's way because that way you got to build yourself up with thick clay. You got to write the law the way you want it. You got to yoke your sister. And the righteous spirit, the which was the original spirit of this covenant, you were to hearken to her law and to her words, which flowed like living waters from Lebanon, we're told. And they come from heaven. And, and God says, and Job says this in Job uh, 31, is it? Uh, verse 1 and 2, made a covenant with my eyes, why then should I think upon a maid for what portion of God is there from above? <coughs> so, we know what took place. The dividing of the pleasant land into two covenants, and man chose a covenant with the harlot, built up Babylon. All of this we've studied and we've come to understand what the controversy of Zion is about. Alright, so, so the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. So, page 2. So Joel 2.2. 2. A day of darkness. This is the description of the day of the Lord. That's going to link us to many other passages. <coughs> and of gloominess. A day of clouds. And of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people. And a strong people. There had not ever been the like of. And neither shall there be any more after it. Even to the years of many generations. Verse 3, a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Verse 4, the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horse women, they're not horsemen, so shall they run like the noise of chariots on the top of mountains, shall they leap. These are the she-goats. Uh, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Now, this description actually leads us to Revelation. You know, if, if we've read Revelation and some of the description there, uh, this takes our thought, our thinking right to that. Um, so, <clears throat> verse 6, Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. Verse 7, They shall run. Now, where does this take us to after we've done the studies that we've done? They shall run like mighty women, not men. They shall climb the wall. Oh, look, there's a wall like women of war, not men. And they shall march every one on her way, and they shall not break their ranks. Now, that, that's important, climb the wall. Because it links us to that passage in Genesis 49:22 that we have looked at and looked at. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches, that word there, is daughters, run over the wall. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Run over the wall. And yet in Joel uh, 2, verse 7, they shall run like mighty women that shall climb the wall like women of war, which is what they are. Because Adam, the first Adam, rejected the spirit of her covenant and that was the spirit of daughter Zion upon them and she was forced to come off of these daughters who were her pleasant land to claim her glory on earth represented as these bodies of the pleasant land known as the daughters of Zion from Israel and she was forced to come off of them, her spirit, and the harlot come in. Okay? Because man wanted it that way. He exalted the harlot in his heart because it meant he got to exalt himself. So, whose daughters went over the wall? And then that kind of uh, in 
your thoughts and when you get looking at the words lead you to the idea in Ezekiel 19 10 thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters she was fruitful and full of branches that word branch there branches there is daughters I mean uh, is female so it's telling you your descendancy is female branch you know when you think of a, a family branch a family line this is female because the woman's seed was identified as the woman's seed in the beginning which was Israel it was the woman's seed that would be blessed in the beginning and that came to be represented as a nation of Israel where her glory was upon it and that meant these daughters who were the scepters the the rulers and so uh, they were planted by the water she was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters the waters is important here because waters is to be identified as your living waters that flow from Lebanon where the true law of heaven was to be found at the mouth no guile in their mouth uh, but man cast off a covenant with these daughters now we've discussed this Ezekiel 1911 and she had strong rod rods for the scepters of them that bear rule and her stature was exalted among the thick branches so we're looking at Israel identified as feminine uh, with the multitude of her branches of her daughters but she was plucked up in fury see we're getting all that allegorical understanding of uh, what happened to the nation of Israel the Shulamite says look not upon me because I am black because my mother's sons were angry with me they made me the keeper of the vineyard but my own I have not kept so she was plucked up in fury she says they lay accusations to my to, against me they lay charges against me and I don't even know what they're talking about she says and uh, so she was cast down to the ground in the east wind I'm still gonna take a look at that east wind there's something to be understood about the east wind dried up her fruit her strong rods were broken and withered and the fire consumed them so the fire here in a sense is allegorical uh, it, it means law um, you know in a negative sense I guess you'd have to say uh, you know because this law this man-made law uh, consumed the righteous daughters out of the land is what it did the man-made law did that uh, it wouldn't hearken to the spirit of their covenant and it drove them from the land those they couldn't drive out they killed all right um, they sold into slavery um, there's many um, things that that were told they did to these these daughters that did actually hold their ground uh, but the bulk of them mother tells them in Micah chapter 2 she says leave for this land is no longer your rest and uh, she had threatened the sons of Israel in the Exodus uh, when they were bringing in the uh, women that Balaam had told Balak to bring in um, she says fine if you don't want my scepter my right hand you won't have her I'll cast her out amongst the lands of the Gentiles uh, and that was largely I believe to some degree considered a land not inhabited right because they did not have the spirit um, but then that's in accordance with what she promises her daughter uh, in Isaiah 49 and in Psalm 2 as well when you go in and you read them so fire can be very much uh, a negative uh, when it comes from the man-made law but if you're not hearkening hearkening to God's law it too can become a fire that will wipe you out of the land um, and that's to be understood God is a just God God's not um, going to um, allow you to continue on in sin uh, you know when the land becomes cleansed uh, of the lie so the fire like I said has that that twofold element to it um, so broken and withered the fire consumed them and it did and the fire which is law is gone out of a rod of her branches which has devoured her fruit so that she had no strong rod to be a scepter to rule so there was a division that's what it looks like it looks actually to me the more and more and I'm just starting to hit on it uh, that the camp of Israel divided into two and I'm not talking about the nation of Israel into Judah and 
and um, the North Kingdom, Israel, I'm actually talking that Israel in the Exodus looks like it literally separated into two camps at some point. Um, but like I said, that's just kind of a working theory at this point. I really have no evidence to back it up. Um, and fire law has gone out of the rod of her branches, which has devoured her fruit so that she had no strong rod to be a scepter to rule. This is a lamentation. That's Jeremiah 9. This is a lamentation and shall be for a lamentation. And indeed, they did lament. They lamented in through Jeremiah, uh, forget the chapter, 6, 8, 9. Um, and it's, they're repeated. It's the same lamentations. And it's for the daughters of Zion that the lamentation is made. Um, so, I mean, that takes you to Genesis 49, 23. Because it's, you know, the fury, they're plucked up in fury. And you see it again in the next verse in Genesis 49, 23. Why that was so. The archers have sorely grieved her. And um, the archers here is 1167. is a name for your husband who wants to be lord and master over woman. And play God with the law as opposed to receiving the law from her who is the other half of his covenant supposedly that he dealt treacherously with which is spoken of and addressed in Malachi chapter 2 and it states that the high priest began to write laws of violence against their sisters it says brothers but keep reading it's absolutely their sisters that they were writing violence into the law against and they say, and God says, you dealt treacherously with the wife, the spirit of your covenant. And um, yet is she the spirit of your covenant. And um, so you see the archers, her husband, uh, have sorely grieved her and shot at her and hated her. They got him, but it's her because the, it's, the, it's the daughters that's running over the wall, which you also see in Joel. Uh, when they go back to take take out the harlots um, is what it looks like uh, so the archers have sorely grieved her and shot at her and hated her which then of course like I just spoke on Song of Songs 1 6 takes us to that verse and verse 24 but her bow her covenant bow means her covenant we think of the rainbow the rainbow the sevenfold colors the sevenfold spirit represents God's covenant with man which he rejected but her bow, her covenant abode and strength in the arms of her hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Israel. And from thence is the shepherdess of Israel. That's who, where she comes from. And this is all identified where she comes from because this is Joseph's blessings. And uh, she comes from the North Kingdom. That's where your queen comes from, not the king. The birthright belongs to the queen. And she has promised full restoration back to her rightful place as the glory that rules over it. Which means the spirit of her covenant, which means the laws of heaven. As originally given to us. Um, so, Isaiah 42, 14 to 25 I have here. So I'm going to take a peek at this and see what it says. I can't remember. It's been a while since I made the notes. So Isaiah 42, verses 14 to 25. Let's start at 14 here. Um, yeah, I thought it was verse 8. Uh, so what does she say? And it is she speaking. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and I have refrained myself. I have restrained myself. She's been restrained because she's, been, she's allowed them to restrain her daughters. That's what she's done. She come off them and she permitted it. And we're told many reasons why it was permitted. Okay? Um, so I have been restrained. I restrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and I will devour at once. This is the branch that sits to Christ. Right hand is number as identified as 113. He's also identified as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek in Psalm 110. And you have three Lord's numbers there. And his is 113 and hers is 136. And this is a description of her going forth. 
I will destroy and I will devour at once. I will make waste mountains and hills, your rulers, your current rulers, which are identified as he goats and rams as well, that made the man-made law and religious lie. And dry up all their herbs and I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up all the pools, all the oceans, all that river of lies, that ocean of lies. Um, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not that's spoken of. They'll say he will bring them in a way, by a way. Uh, I've come across this verse in similarity in other places. Uh, I've also Nahum, he will draw, who makes the rivers dry, the oceans dry? Well, she does. The Spirit does. Not he. You've got the wrong Lord. The Lord's number that does this is 136. And she sits to his right hand in Psalm 110. And she is the strength of his rule, of his rulership. She is the spirit of the covenant restored. And as the woman being the last thing created, she represents the glory and the queen that rules it with the law of heaven. That does not mean this uh, law of, it wouldn't have been in the beginning, but it has to become uh, a rod of iron in order to cut away the foreskin representing the covenant with the harlot spirit, particularly during the millennial reign. She has to rule with a rod of iron to cut away those that will not receive the spirit of the covenant. Now in the beginning it was not that way. But they wanted it that way when they rejected the spirit of her covenant. So she says, and you see that rod of iron in rule in Psalm 2, and it is a daughter, it is her number, 136 identified there. Um, and I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. And I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them. And I will not forsake them. Because I am their mother. You see, she's cut from her mother. We're told that in Isaiah 51, daughter's eye. And what that means is she is the spirit of the original covenant that was found through Israel. The first Israel. We're told that these daughters are actually a remnant of the original Israel. And what that means is when they, come, they are reborn of the dust of the earth, and God says, I hear a familiar spirit as of one that speaketh out of the dust of the earth. That's Isaiah 29. And what that means is I'm hearing the spirit of Israel again. They are being reborn upon the earth again, and they are the original remnant daughters. And um, so uh, they shall be turned back. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Um, so was that all I was going to read? I was going to move on here. Hear ye deaf and look ye blind that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger and I, that I sent? Who is blind as she that is perfect and blind as the Lord's? servant. She's talking about Israel and her daughters of Israel. They've been blinded to the truth. They went to sleep and she's, she's, she, they're, but they're waking up. And um, because the Lord is awaking up and she's awaking as a warrior that's been drunk on wine. It says the allegory there is to strong dark, to, to a lion theology. Um, and she is angered by the image that she sees it's male, the image that she sees, and she is angered by that. Um, seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ear, but you don't hear. You're still not listening. And uh, she has some choice words that she speaks concerning that, again in Isaiah 28. And she says, if you mock my spirit when she returns back to you, the consummation I'll read it in a second here but it says the Lord is well pleased for her righteousness sake not his and she will magnify the law you see and make it honorable they want to stick this on a man again Cirrus Cirrus just simply means anointed one so this is an anointed one from the original remnant daughters who are reborn of the dust of the earth with a remembrance of what the real law looks like because it's been written on our hearts, all right? 
And so she says, because of, of their existence, uh, because of their knowledge of who I truly am and what I stand for, I will magnify the law and make it honorable because of them. Um, but this is a people robbed and spoiled. They are all of them snared in holes. <laughs> They've been ensnared in the lies of fallen Adam and the harlot. Um, they are all of them snared in holes and they are hid in prison houses. They are for a prey and none delivereth for a spoil and none saith restore. What did God say to the Shulamite in Song of Songs 6.13? Return, return, O Shulamite. What might we see when the Shulamite returns? As it were the company of two armies. That's Mahai Naim, God's presence. And they're holding no guile in their mouth. Virgins does not apply to a man. They always have applied the term virgin Old Testament. 100% applies to women. It never applied to a man, ever. And uh, New Testament, oh, they try to use it and make it apply to a male. I believe they've managed to use it once concerning men and women, both. But virgin is a terminology applied to women, to females, not to males. And so the virgins, the 144,000, known as the presence of God, we've identified that, uh, returns back to God. And that's this remnant reborn out of the dust of the earth with the knowledge of who God was, somehow it's embedded in our genetic code, I don't know, in our spirit that comes upon us, we're remembering it more and more, at least I am, and there is some idea of a remembrance there. Um, so, uh, for a spoil and none saith, restore. Uh, who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? Who gave Israel? for a spoil, and Israel to the robbers. They got Jacob up here. Did not the Lord, she, against whom we have sinned. How did we sin? We forgot about her. We forgot about the Creator. What were we warned in uh, Ecclesiastics? Remember the Creator in the day of thy youth. Well, our Creator is not male. Our Creator, if we hearken to what God created on earth, which we are supposed to do, God says, I manifested my Godhead in this creation, and yet you still deny your Creator as she. And I show you clearly that it is woman that gives life to you. The tabernacle below reflects the one above, and you still cast your Creator off. And my laws of peace, fairness, truth, equity, I did not favor males over my daughters. But you have put me into the position where now I have to put forth my rod of arm to rule and to bring it all back into the correct standing with me. And um, so they have sinned for they would not walk in her ways. They wouldn't follow after the laws that was in her mouth. I purchased her with the truth long ago, this congregation that was mine. Um, neither were they obedient unto her law. They wouldn't listen to her. Therefore she hath poured upon him and her the fury of her anger and the strength of battle, and it has set him on fire round about, don't seem to know it, and her either. Take a look around you girls, <laughs> women. Um, yet he knew not, and she didn't either. And it burned her, yet she laid it not to her heart. I, I'm so shocked when you, you, you reason the truth out, and it's so easily reasoned in the heart, and yet women are your biggest, um, you know, they'll push it off and say, no, 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 there's no such thing as a female God. Well then, you know, how about I just hand you an eraser and you can erase your form. <laughs> uh, either God lied, when God made woman, or man lied when he wrote this in the Bible. It's one or the other, and you're not going to have it both ways. Um, so there's questions that needs to be answered. And um, so also we want to read Zephaniah, I have here. Zephaniah chapter 3, we'll begin at verse 12, I guess. Um, see, it's already at 30 minutes. 
So we'll go to Zephaniah. Chapter 3. Verse 12. We begin at verse 12. So, I will also leave in the midst of the unafflicted and poor people. That's the daughters of Zion. Uh, and they will trust in the name of the Lord. Um, the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity. This is your first fruits. Nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and not shall make them afraid. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart of the daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath taken away thy judgment. She has cast out thine enemy. The queen of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Thou shalt not see evil any more. Verse 16, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion let not thine hands be slack. Verse 17, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty, and she will save. She will rejoice over thee with the joy. She will rest in her love, and she will joy over thee with singing. Now, not only is it the daughter's you know, when she's talking about the nation of Israel, it, it's the restoration of her children back to her and the spirit of her covenant. So she's, it says, what has Israel not obtained that what she sought for? What did she seek for? Well, she sought for her children, and that's why she goes forth as a travailing woman. She's seeking her children that will, uh, you know, in a sense, be the new Israel. Um, that will hearken to her laws and to the spirit of her covenant. And um, so I will gather them, verse 18, that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, for whom the reproach of it was burden. And it is a burden to carry for the daughters, for the daughters of Israel that are, care, are reborn of the dust of the earth and have knowledge and understanding of this truth, of this theology. They have worn the lie before as if it was a burden upon them and then out of that burden comes the deliverance of the children that burden is is upon them to have to deliver the children so behold at that time i will undo all that afflict thee and i will save her that halteth and i will gather her that was driven out and it does say her and I will get thee praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. And that's the burden, the shame of this lying theology wherein we did. We actually believed this at some point. I did in my life. I believed this lying theology of he, 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 God. And that woman, tuh, she was to blame for it all. That's how it came at me from the time I was little. Uh, and I think that's the shame. Uh, that brings on so much stress in this world. That's the undercurrents of, of, you know, the law. To be ashamed of who you are, especially as a woman, you know. Uh, because the laws is written to dri drive us down. Well, it's the poor of the flock. That's what women are called, the poor of the flock. Uh, at that time will I bring you again, even in a time that I gather you, for I'll make you a name and a praise. What's the name? Israel, the daughters of Zion among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Okay, so we're going to continue on in Joel 2, verse 8. Neither shall one thirst uh, thrust another. All right? Uh, they shall walk every one. And I've stopped here because that word one there is actually 1397. Now, did I write it down? But actually, they shall walk every one one um yeah neither shall one thrust another i got the word here is 251 for another and one but when i hit that the way that it said there neither shall one thrust another they shall walk every one i thought of that term that we see describing the cherubim one to another the wings were joined one to another so i see that in that description there ne neither shall one thrust another they shall walk every one 
So in Ezekiel 1 9, it says their wings were joined one to another. You look the word one up there, it's 802, Hebrew 802. And it's a feminine noun meaning a woman, a wife, or a female. And to another, the word here is 269, feminine noun meaning sister, together, other, an intimate female relative. Wow, look at that. So it's a description of, um, you know, the cherubim or cherubim that you see in Ezekiel 1, 9, 1 to another. And I couldn't help draw that correlation uh, with the way that it was said in Joel 2, 8, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one. Okay, now where's my page four? Every one in her path, right? So you get that uh, understanding that they're all moving in the same direction. Much like you see that description of the cherubim and the seraphim. They move together in one direction. And uh, we know that they're eternal. You can't hurt them. Um, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Again, they are representing the eternal spirit. You can't hurt them. Verse 9, they shall run to and fro. There's an image of the spirit again running to and fro. In the city, they shall run upon the wall. Look, look they're running upon the wall here. Just like you see in Genesis 24, 23. Joseph, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough whose daughters, branches, run over the wall. So they're running upon the wall here. Uh, because, remember, the archers, the men, their husbands, supposedly, who was supposed to be in covenant, or the men that were in covenant with this spirit, attacked her, shot at her, and were hostile towards her. Yet her covenant remained steady, and her strong arms were made agile by the hands of the Mighty One of Israel, by the name of the Shepherdess, which is the daughter of Zion. She is the Shepherdess, known as also your Queen, or the Holy One of Israel, or Mother Jerusalem, um, who is the Rock. She's identified as your Rock. Who's your Rock? Deuteronomy 32, 18, she says, You forgot the Rock that uh, writhe in pain to bring you forth to birth you. You're not going to get a man out of that, no matter how hard you try, um, of Israel. So uh, they shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows. There's that term, windows, like a thief. They'll be stole like a thief in the night. Um, the children <laughs> is almost the, the understanding there. But what did we uh, say in um, Jeremiah 9, verse 20, uh, 21? For death has come up into our windows, right? And this has to do with the day of the Lord, right? Joel 2, 1 has to do, Joel 2 has to do with a description of the day of the Lord. And here we have, for death has come up into our windows, when the daughters of Zion were being taken out, the spirit of their covenant. Death had come up into the windows. Well, now it all reverses. Just like you see uh, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, says you put strong drink to your sister's lips, to your neighbor's. Well, that's actually uh, your neighbor Israel, uh, Judah's neighbor Israel. He put strong drink to her lips. That means lying theology. And got her drunk so he could expose her nakedness, make her play as harlot. But it, then it says, shameful spewing will come upon your foreskin. And um, so you see the turnaround taking place. And it's the same in this description when they enter into the windows here. When death came into their windows and now it's turning, it's turning face, right? Boat face. They shall enter in the windows like a thief. So the word here, you know, it almost has like a living water flowing through something. Because when you look up, Lattice. Um, the word here is not 699, but 699 does mean a lattice, a window, a sluice, a noun feminine, word for windows. There's also another word for windows, which is 7639, which is a feminine noun, lattice, a network, a webbing. Look at that, the weaving of the truth. Um, and 2474 window noun latticed window is given in the notes. So that's the word that they do give here, 2474 for window. And it does have the idea of a latticed window is given in the notes. A window as 
perforated or like pierced with holes. Um, so y you do get that understanding of a lattice, a window, uh, which it, they also say floodgate for it. Uh, so again, you're seeing living waters in a sense, flooding and pouring through the windows in a sense. And so you're seeing your feminine here. You are not seeing your masculine. Because where it lines up, it lines up to the feminine. It does not line up to the masculine. Joel 2 verse 10, the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So what's that a description of the day of the Lord in Revelation 6, 12 to 17? Is it not? Um, do I have, I don't have Revelation. Yeah, I do. Uh, and it said, um, okay, verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a cloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs. That's, that's this description here. Um, they're casting down the harlot spirit is what these daughters are doing and taking back their rightful birthright. Um, as fig tree cast her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, which is also, in some sense, an allegory to Michael standing up, Mikael, she who is like God, standing up for her children. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain not and removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountain, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of her, not him, that sitteth on the throne. It's her wrath. We're told that in Psalm 110. And from the wrath of the Lamb, and many other places we're told it. For the great day of her wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So, we see um, the wrath here being described, but we're told that the wrath belongs to the spirit of the covenant that was rejected. And that was the daughter of Zion known as the key of David. She was rejected. And now she is forced to rule with a rod of iron. And um, so, and the Lord shall utter her voice before her army for her camp. The camp here is Mahanaim. Um, they actually give the word 4264, uh, the Mahana, but uh, if you're looking at the double camp, which this obviously is the camp of the daughter of Zion or the presence of God, because she is uttering her voice before the uh, presence of the camp, it says. Um, okay, that's next. Uh, which is also 4264 Mahanim, which is a double camp, as in 4266, camp of God. Um, the study Bible. Uh, the Lord raises her voice at the head, she is the head, in the presence of her army. So you got the presence here, army. Indeed, her camp is very large. For mighty are those who obey her command, for the day of the Lord is great and very dreadful. Who can stand? So the word there for army in this verse is fortress, a fortress wall. So the fortress wall is identified once again as a daughter, as a feminine, as the bride in Song of Songs chapter 8 when you go in and you read it. Now, there were some other passages I had in mind when I was doing this. Am I going to be able to remember them? So, um, you know what, I think I'm going to end it there. Um, and I'm going to go back through and see what it was that I needed uh, to throw in. Uh, one of them was found in Micah 7 again. Um, the best of them is like a briar. Okay. Uh, both hands are skilled at evil. The prince and the judge demand bribe. When the powerful utters his evil desire, they all conspire together. Uh, the best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a hedge of thorns. The day for your watchmen have come. The day of your visitation. The visitation is uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, now is the time of their confusion. Do not rely on a friend and do not trust in a companion. Seal the doors of your mouth from him who lies in your arms. Uh, your husband is a warning to the women. 
Um, they turned on you once. They'll do it again. They are now. <laughs> They're turning on us. They're making laws against us, unrighteous decrees. And uh, it was stated they did it in the very beginning. And so uh, the rod is coming. Uh, yeah, the other thing I wanted to talk of on was, um, where was it? Did I pull it up? It was in Isaiah 28. We wanted to take a quick look at this. And it has to do with the fulfilling of the, the current covenant that man has exalted in his heart. So, let me see if I can get my computer to work. And I'll wrap it up on this. So I think it's the last. And I think this is playing out right now. Um, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden death. This actually isn't the part I'm talking about. Um, yeah, from that time that it goeth forth, it shall take you for morning. By morning shall it pass over by day and night, and it shall be a vexation only to understand the report. For the bed is shorter than that a man can stretch, stretch himself on it, and the covering narrower than that he can wrap himself in. But this is the part right here of this. For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. She shall be wroth as is in the valley of Gibeon, that she may do her work, her strange work, and bring to pass her act, her strange act. What, it, what that is, is correlating to was, if you go back and do a study of what the Lord's strange work was, the Lord actually turned to be an enemy against her own people. And she's going to do it again. Because the Christians consider themselves her people. She's going to rise up and she's going to perform this strange act of showing them the truth and going forth as a, a travailing woman. And she says, I will destroy and I will devour at once. You'll either receive the spirit of my covenant or you will not. And I think she's addressing that strange act of the Christians. Uh, the new spirit of the covenant is here. And so she says, this is the warning, she says, when the spirit arrives, that will jump up. She says, before I do a new thing, I will tell you of it, before it springs forth. And that's the new tree, uh, re or, or the new seed, which she speaks of in this chapter as well, coming forth. Um, now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong, the law against you. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth, a destruction for the whole earth. So that means the wrap-up, the completion. This is being completed by the Spirit. Give ye ear and hear my voice, hearken and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all, way to, all day to sow? Does he open? Does she open and break the clods of her ground? When she had made plain the face thereof, does she not cast abroad the fitches and, and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? What's she talking about? For God doth instruct her to discretion and doth teach her, and him she teaches. Uh, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. Red corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it nor break it with the wheel of his cart nor bruise it with his horsemen. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in work. Um, I also want it to... Uh, there was another part I wanted to throw in there. And maybe I'll just include it in the notes. Um, but this is all about the day of the Lord. And the turnaround. And the original spirit, wife, of Adam's covenant. Um, taking back what belonged to her from the very beginning. And um, she is seen doing that. This, this is the day of the Lord where she does all of that. And she does so begin to rule with a rod of iron. She has to. In order to cut away 
the foreskin and it is the eighth day uh, that the new day dawns right um, so that's the spirit of her covenant completely restored and um, you know I'll add some other things in the notes uh, I mean you're I'm always limited on uh, the amount of space I could write and write forever um, when I get going but um, I think I'm gonna wrap it up on that I wish I'd have made a few more notes um, video still 50 minutes um, and there's certainly there's so many things that I could have wrote down and put in there it can get to be quite overwhelming when you get studying like I said and and you just find you keep finding you keep finding you keep finding and you keep seeing how it all comes together uh, to tell you consistently that man rejected the original spirit of his covenant known as the daughters of Zion known as the key of David and instead exalted in his heart the harlot spirit uh, known as uh, the key the the key of Solomon which is Babylon the harlot so he could write his own law write his own religious lies and subjugate his righteous sisters under him and uh, she did she did she became subjugated under him and uh, the they're attempting to do it again and yet in um, Isaiah 28 there's there's a warning to be hearkened to you don't mock my convoy uh, you don't mock uh, my contingency that I send to you um, because um, the consumption has been decreed by me and God says to her in Psalm 2 she says ask of me the nations I'll give them all and that was a promise that she made to her in um, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 49 we've studied it and looked at it um, so I'm going to wrap it up on that um, I thank any for watching my video I appreciate it I thank you for taking the time trying to understand the theology um, I hope the dear Lord blesses you with an abundance of truth and uh, I hope you all have a really nice uh, evening and uh, Thanks.